In the pursuit of understanding war, its causes, conduct, and consequences, the MacArthur Memorial presents The First World War, Part 1, 1914, The Road to War. The First World War. It is the end and the beginning of an age. The year is 1914. Europe is the center of commerce, industrialization, science, and culture. Europe is also home to great empires. Abroad, European powers have colonized Africa and Asia. Europe is also home to glittering monarchies. Many of the royal families of Europe are related. Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany, King George V of England, and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia are all cousins. It is a golden age of European power and civilization. Many who live in this era feel they are living in the most civilized, technologically advanced time in history, and they are proud of their achievements. So how does this modern, interconnected, civilized world crash into a war that will engulf the globe and consume more than 10 million lives? Historians point to the following causes. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the forces of nationalism, militarism, the alliance system of Europe, and the failure of diplomacy to avert war. It all begins in Sarajevo. Sarajevo, the capital of the Austro-Hungarian territory of Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Balkan Peninsula. It is 28 June 1914, and Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is touring the Balkan city by motorcade with his wife, Sophie. In an age of nationalism, the Balkans are a diverse conglomeration of ethnic and religious groups that for centuries have been dominated by the Ottoman Turkish and Austro-Hungarian empires. The decline of the two empires has made the divergent groups of the Balkans desperate for independence. One such group awaits the Archduke and his wife along their parade route in Sarajevo. They have conspired to kill them. Shortly after 11 a.m., Gavrilo Princip, a 19-year-old Bosnian conspirator, opposed to Austro-Hungarian dominance, assassinates the Archduke and his wife. 36 days later, the continent is at war. The Archduke's murder triggers the First World War, but the seeds of conflict have been germinating in Europe for decades. Following Napoleon Bonaparte's defeat at Waterloo in 1815, ending nearly 20 years of warfare, the European continent enjoyed a period of relative peace by maintaining a balance of power between nations. The objective being to prevent war and any one nation from becoming too powerful. Germany's unification in 1871, under the guidance of Prussia's Iron Chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, and Prussia's Kaiser Wilhelm I, upsets this delicate balance. Following a quick series of wars with Denmark in 1864, Austria in 1866, and the Franco-Prussian War against France in 1870-1871, Germany becomes the dominant military power in Central Europe. Germany's rise sparks a European arms race. Adhering to the concept of militarism, the belief that a government or people should maintain a strong military and be prepared to use it aggressively to defend or promote national interests, the great powers begin perfecting the art of rapidly mobilizing their forces for war. Chancellor Bismarck, however, knows war as a danger to Germany's position and safety. He masterfully crafts a system of alliances to keep peace between the nations. The Three Emperors League of 1873, the Dual Alliance of 79, the Three Emperors Alliance of 81, the Triple Alliance of 82, and the Reinsurance Treaty of 1887. Bismarck's goal is a strong Germany and the isolation of a revenge-minded France. His greatest fear is an alliance between Russia and France, which would mean an unwinnable two-front war for Germany. Bismarck's fragile network of alliances, however, falls apart in 1890 with his dismissal by a new German Kaiser, Wilhelm II. Mercurial and temperamental, 
Kaiser Wilhelm II is incapable of handling diplomacy as deftly as Bismarck. In 1891, he allows the reinsurance treaty with Russia to lapse. Russia then allies itself with France in the Franco-Russian Entente of 1892. Bismarck's greatest fear for Germany is realized. Germany is surrounded. The Kaiser further isolates Germany by championing a naval armaments program. The grandson of Queen Victoria, the Kaiser has a love-hate relationship with Great Britain. His desire is for Germany to have a naval fleet to match the celebrated naval power of Great Britain. Great Britain, aloof from continental affairs since the fall of Napoleon, warily eyes Germany's naval expansion and allies itself with France and Russia. The Entente Cordiale is created with France in 1904 and the Anglo-Russian Entente in 1907. Now isolated, Germany has only the weak, fragmented Austro-Hungarian Empire and Kingdom of Italy for allies. By 1914, Europe is divided into two armed camps. There is the Triple Alliance of Germany, Italy, and Austria, and the Triple Entente of France, Britain, and Russia. With nationalistic fervor high and their professional militaries ready and war plans and mobilization plans prepared, all that it will take is a spark to ignite the flames of war. The assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand supplies that spark, and the failed diplomacy of Europe's leaders will feed the flames. While Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife are buried, Austria sends a diplomatic mission to Germany, seeking support for a war with the Balkan nation of Serbia. Austria blames Serbia for the Archduke's murder, and its leaders are set on war. The Kaiser pledges support but advises swiftness in Austria's actions before Russia, which sees itself as Serbia's protector, can react. This is considered Germany's blank check to Austria. Austria-Hungary waits three weeks and then presents Serbia with an ultimatum to avoid war. Foreign Minister Count Leopold von Berchtold, however, crafts the ultimatum to be unacceptable, and that it demands Serbia surrender its sovereignty as an independent state to Austria. The 15-point ultimatum is delivered to Belgrade on 23 July with a 48-hour time limit. The Serbian government agrees to comply with many of the terms, but refuses to surrender sovereignty to Austria-Hungary. Serbia mobilizes its forces for war, gives its reply, and then petitions Russia for support. In St. Petersburg, Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Sazanov, is incredulous at the ultimatum. He states in shock, this means the European war. Russia pledges its support for Serbia and enacts its policy of preparation for war, beginning steps towards mobilization. Europe is now on the brink. If Austria invades Serbia, Russia will go to war against Austria to protect Serbia. Germany is treaty bound to aid Austria if it goes to war against Russia. If Germany goes to war against Russia, then France will have to declare war on Germany and Austria in support of its ally, Russia. Now only the diplomats can stave off destruction, but they are not up to the task and some even want war. In London, Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey is stunned by Austria's ultimatum to Serbia. He immediately calls for a four-power conference to avert war. He believes that Germany is the only one that can stop Austria now. Kaiser Wilhelm II is vacationing on his yacht when Gray's proposal arrives in Berlin. Upon his return on July 27th, he is furious, realizing his blank check of support to Austria has brought Germany to the brink of a two-front war. After reading Serbia's reply to the ultimatum, however, the Kaiser believes it to be conciliatory and war averted. He orders his chancellor, Theobald von Bethmann Holwig, to press the Austrians to accept Britain's offer of mediation. In Vienna, Count Berchtold and Army General Conrad von Hotzendorf are set on war. Berchtold discards Britain's offer of mediation and pushes for an immediate declaration of war. A declaration of war requires the approval of Austria-Hungary's 84-year-old emperor, Franz Joseph. 
Berk told lies to get his signature, telling him that Serbia has already attacked the realm. German Army Chief of Staff Helmuth von Moltke fears war is imminent and voices dire warnings about what will happen if Germany fails to mobilize before Russia and France. The fear of war is now matched only by the fear of not being ready for war. The German Chancellor warns Russia and France not to mobilize in order to maintain peace, but his messages are clumsy and viewed as threats. Then war begins. Austrian warships shell Belgrade, Serbia's capital. In a last-minute effort, the cousins Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany and Tsar Nicholas II of Russia exchange a series of personal telegrams to prevent war, but it's too late as Nicholas reveals Russia is mobilizing. Russia's announcement of mobilization finds willing allies in French President Raymond Poincaré and General Joseph Joffre. France activates its troops on the German frontier. On August 1st, Germany mobilizes and declares war on Russia the next day. Ironically, German pre-war plans dictate that mobilization means war against France. In order to win a two-front war, German strategy aims to quickly defeat France and then swing east and attack Russia. On August 3rd, the war begins. Advancing on France, German troops invade neutral Belgium. This act brings Great Britain, protector of Belgium, into the war on the side of the Allies. The common assumption is that the war will be over by Christmas that it will be a quick bloodletting, a way to burn off excess energy and restore a workable balance of power for Europe. But the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand has unleashed forces that no one can control. This will not be a war like any other. And so in August of 1914, as the war begins, few realize that the next four years will result in Europe being torn apart and in the ushering in of a brand new age. In a prophetic statement at the beginning of the war, British Foreign Secretary Sir Edward Grey remarks, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We will not see them lit again in our time.